Well, good morning. Oh, come on. Let's try that again. Good morning. Man, it's good to see you today. You look good. You sound good. It was like you were aiming for church this morning. Now, I'm doing all this so you get used to looking at me. Your pastor's got hair, and you got a hairless guy up here now, just giving you an opportunity to get used to looking at me. I'm sure glad to be with you today. Uh, I give oversight to 450 churches in Northern California in the state of Nevada, and it is my very first Sunday here at Cornerstone with you guys, and it has really been a terrific day, and I want to thank Pastor Scott for trusting me with an opportunity to come and be with you, to speak to you, and when he told me, oh, I'd like to have you come, then he left town. So you're on your own. You got me, you're on your own. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So thank you very much for uh, being here today, and I wanted to introduce my wife to you. Valerie and I have been married for 38 years. Valerie, stand up and turn around and say hi to everybody. <laughs> Valerie and I have two sons. They're both adults. They're both married, and they're both out of the house. Praise God. <laughs> they don't live with us anymore. I told both of our daughters-in-law on their wedding days just before the, the glorious days began, I said, at the end of this day, they are yours and yours alone, and there are no givebacks. Uh, when our boys were born, we brought them home, we laid them in the crib, and I began praying, God, create women that will take these boys from our home, that we can, we can be back to the way this thing started. And God was faithful, not just once, but twice to get our dudes out of our house. And we have two grandsons. We can't do anything to produce girls in our family. We have boys and grandsons. They're five and seven. Both my sons are pastors. My daughter-in-laws are in ministry. My dad's a pastor. My mom's a pastor. We get together at Thanksgiving. We write sermons. That's just how it goes at our house. So, <laughs> Sure glad to be with you today. I'm also traveling with Chrislyn Cox. Chrislyn is with SUM. She has a booth that is out in the lobby, and it's an uh, opportunity for higher education through the Assemblies of God to help you do any schooling to get you ready for ministry. Some of you, you see, when you were young, when you were a child, or when you were a young person, teenager, or maybe even just recently, God put a call of God on your life. He set you apart. He let you know that he had something he wanted you to do. He specifically said, I have something for you. And you knew that you were called. And then life started to happen. And the cares of life started to happen. And then some problems and even some mistakes and some difficulties crept in. And lots and lots of people in our churches that have a call of God on their life have set that to the side because of the fact that they got into a difficult season. And they have said, I know that I'm no longer usable to God because I went through a tough patch in my life. Now I want you to know in Romans 11, it says that the call of God is irrevocable. And what that means is God doesn't change his mind about you just because you got into a tough season and just because there were some mistakes and just because there were some problems doesn't mean that God has pulled his hands off and that he's done with that call. The call of God on your life is irrevocable. And that's how the promises of God work. They're irrevocable. They don't change. God doesn't change. God doesn't change his mind. And when your pastor's been doing a whole series on promises. And I love the fact that Pastor Scott is talking to you about the promises of God. And one of them is that the call of God is irrevocable. So if there's anything you need to do on your education to continue after the call of God on your life, please see Crystal and she can help you out. I want to talk to you today about a promise of God as you guys are coming in, getting ready on the Easter season. But just before I do, I want to pray for you. And I don't want to pray that God will anoint me and I don't want to pray that God will anoint his word because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. And I know if I preach God's word to you, God's going to anoint that. What I want to pray for today are your ears, that God would anoint your ears. The Bible says, for he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit would say to the church. And I just want to use my prayer time today for your ears that the Spirit of God would speak uniquely to you about who you are and where you are, I'm not nearly as interested in you hearing from me today as I am you hearing from the Spirit of God because that's where life is coming from, that's where change is going to come from, that's where hope is going to come from, that's where help is going to come from. So let me pray for your ears real quick, all right? Father, thanks for today. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you for your word that is alive and active. Lord, it penetrates and it cuts past all the nonsense of life right to the heart of the issue, and it touches us and changes us. Then, Lord, I pray for our ears today that they would be anointed by you, that we would hear the voice of God, that we would hear what the Spirit of God would say to us. Lord, let my words and my concepts and my precepts fall to the ground dead, but Lord, your word, your concepts, your precepts, may they penetrate and give life and help and hope. Lord, I pray that late this week we'll still be thinking about the promise of God from your word. Bless and keep, Lord, each set of ears that are in this place. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to be our chief communicator. We submit to your presence in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Psalm 145, verse 8, God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. The Bible says that God is a gracious God. It's a promise that God is gracious to you. It means he loves you. It means he loves being gracious with you. God loves to bless people beyond what they deserve. It's his nature to be gracious to us. Aren't you glad for that? That God treats us better than what we deserve? Aren't you glad that God doesn't give you what you deserve today? Aren't you glad that God looks at you and he says, you know what? It's my nature to be gracious. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be gracious. To live this Christian lifestyle well, I think we need to understand the power of this promise that God is gracious to us. It's the heart of who we are as Christians. It's the heart of our faith. It's the heart of our walk. It's the heart of our churches that God is gracious to us. It's how our relationship with God works. And when you understand grace, you're going to feel closer to God. When you understand grace, you're going to come to God quicker when you make a mistake. When you understand grace, you're going to have greater value in your worship times. When you understand grace, you're going to know that God is always glad to hear from you, and he's always glad to see you, and you don't have to come in and convince God that he needs to hear you and listen to you. Grace is one of those things that is easily seen in one of the minor characters of Scripture, And around the Easter time, we talk about him, but the rest of the year, he's virtually ignored. And in his life, we see the manifestation of God's grace, and not some sort of an American work ethic where you only get what you earn, and you only get what you work for, and whatever's coming your way, it's because you make it happen. That is not at work in this story. His story is recorded in Matthew 27, and when we meet this man, he's in prison, and he's waiting execution. He's done something heinous, and in Luke chapter 23, we are told that he is a rebel and he is a murderer. He's defiant, he's violent, he's a troublemaker, and he's a man who took another man's life. He has found himself out of favor with the Roman government, and the Roman government was known for swift and brutal forms of justice. According to this story, uh, Barabbas is waiting for a fate he had well earned and well deserved. And as he sat in his cell, the crowd outside starts yelling his name. According to Luke, they yelled, release Barabbas to us. A chill must have shot down his spine as right after that they start saying, crucify him, crucify him. Barabbas, I imagine, was terrified knowing that the end was near because of the mistakes he had made and the things he had done. A Roman soldier's heavy footsteps are heard coming down the corridor and stopping at his cell door. Keys jingle and a lock turns and a door opens and the big guard walks in and says to Barabbas, you're free, go home. Your charges are paid in full by another. What happened? Grace happened. The guard plainly tells him, 
we're going to kill Jesus instead. That's grace. Guilty, condemned, (laughs) deserving the punishment, no way out in yourself. And Jesus steps in and pays the price and takes care of the consequences of your sin action for all eternity. Wow, God's love in action. God giving me what I need and not just what I deserve. You need to know there's a difference between grace and mercy. Mercy is when God doesn't give us what we deserve, which is punishment, and grace is when God gives us stuff that we don't deserve, which is his blessings. I know that many of you are familiar with the word grace. Some of you are know that you are saved by grace. Maybe you have followed Christ for many years. But I've discovered that many, many Christian people know that they're saved by grace, but then they go on to live a life where they're trying to earn God's favor on a daily basis, as if God is some sort of an unpleasable parent, and we're doing our very best just to get him to like us. I talked to a 77-year-old woman not too long ago. She said to me, Brett, I've been a, I've been a, a Christian all of my life. I accepted the Lord when I was a little girl, but every day I feel guilty. Every day I feel like I'm not doing enough, like I don't give enough, and I don't pray enough, and I don't read my Bible enough, and I'm just not doing enough, and every day I feel guilty in my life and in my relationship with God. That's a shortage of understanding God's grace toward you and the way that God feels about you and that he is rich in grace toward you. Even though you know you're saved by grace, Still, a lot of Christians act like the way we get to heaven is by doing a lot of good stuff. Your entire life is like you're trying to build on on positive on positive so that God will somehow be pleased with you. Nothing in the world you could ever do would make God love you more than he does right now. And nothing that you have ever done or could ever do would stop God from loving you as much as he does right now. Nothing you could ever do or say could ever get God to pull his love back off of you. you got to remember, when God moved you into the picture of his family, he didn't hire you. He adopted you. He said, I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want you to be a part of the family. It's not about your works. It's about his grace. And when you really understand grace, it transforms not only your relationship with God, but the joy levels and the satisfaction levels in your own walk with Christ. I want to do an acrostic with you today on this word grace and just remind you of a few principles around this concept that are so key around this promise that God is gracious to us. The G stands for gift. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard, and all need to be made right with God by His grace, which is a free gift. This American work ethic that we have in our mind is seeped into the church and into our walk with Christ that we think we need to earn our way to heaven on being good enough to get in. As a matter of fact, if you were to go out into Manteca and start asking people today, how do you get to heaven? you would get a lot of very, very interesting answers. Some of the answers would be like this. If you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. If you do more good things than bad things in life, you get to go to heaven. Well, you get to go to heaven by being a moral person and a good person and trying really, really hard not to do anything to hurt anybody else. Then you get to go to heaven. Somehow, if you get to heaven and you've been a good person, God's going to go, ah, you weren't perfect, but you were pretty good. Come on in. That's based on works. That's not based on grace. You need to understand that God says your salvation is absolutely free. It's a gift. It's something that's given to you. You can't earn it. You can't buy it and you can't make it happen. There's a fundamental difference between Christianity and every other world religion is that every other world religion, people are doing things to try and earn a deity's favor. And if you took any world religion and you boiled it down to one word, it would be the word do 
what you have to do to earn favor with the deity so that you can be seen positively. If you take Christianity and you boil the whole thing down to one word, it's not the word do, it's the word done. It's already been done for you through Christ by God's grace. God gives you salvation. You don't do anything to earn it. He paid for your salvation. He paid for your sins. He's already done it for you. It is a gift. Wow. The R is received through faith. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it's not from yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The reason that this thing comes by God as a gift through faith is so we're not running around bragging about what we did to get close to God, about how we earned our way into favor with God. Why faith? Why is faith such a big deal in this component? Well, there's two, two reasons. The first one is this. Anything that God is a part of Anything that God does, anything that God does with you, anything that God does through you will always have an aspect and a component of faith because the Bible tells us in Hebrews that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, God would never ask you to do anything that doesn't please him. God would never ask you to be a part of something that doesn't please him. God would never introduce something into your world that doesn't please him. He wants you to please him, and for that reason, everything that God ever brings to you and trusts to you, asks of you, has a faith component, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So for God to bring something to you without a faith component would be an inconsistency in God's character. The second reason there has to be a faith component in this thing is because of the fact that at some point, you're simply going to stop in your life when you are examining the grace of God and the faithfulness of God and the love of God and the forgiveness of God, and you're going to stop and you're going to look at yourself and you're going to have a reality moment where you're just going to say, why? Why would God have grace on me? Why would God love me? All the things I've done, all the things I've said, all the mistakes I've made, why would God treat me like that? And as you wrestle with that, and there's no connection point between how you deserve it because you don't. It's just a gift from God that he initiated and at some point, you have to say, I'm just going to accept God's forgiveness, his love, and his grace on faith. I'm just going to accept it because that's what God's word says. It's a gift. It's received by faith. The A is that it's available to everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God doesn't play favorites. Regardless of your background, regardless of your status, regardless of your sin, regardless of where you've been, what you've done, what you've said, how you've acted, whether you're a religious person or a non-religious person or no religious background at all, all of us get treated the same. When we call on the name of the Lord, he hears us and he responds. God says that it's available to anyone who will open their heart in faith. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, there are no quotas in heaven. It doesn't say that only real good people will be in heaven or only really smart people can call on the name of the Lord or only really religious people can call on anybody, everyone. It's the nachos are like age 18 to 23 around here. Not everyone can have nachos. That's limited. That's not like this. I, I'm sitting here three times today listening to nacho announcements. My wife, when we get home, is making me nachos, and I'm 58. And doggone it, I'm having nachos today. But around here, you can't have nachos unless you're 18 to 23 or 26 or whatever that was. What was the age? 26. 26. 
All right, so that's not like this at all. Anyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, 18 to 26 and beyond on both sides, you go ahead and call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. It's not like nachos, it's like God. Okay. It's a sad thing that even though we know that God offers us his grace, his unconditional gift to us, it's amazing how many Christian people are still trying to measure up and work their way into heaven. They think that something in their lives is making them good enough to deserve God's grace through Christ. Heaven is perfect, God is perfect, and I'm not. If I'm ever going to be there, something has to happen to get me into a place that's completely perfect with a perfect God, and I don't fit into that unless God makes access for a guy like me to get into a perfect place to be with a perfect God. And God made it possible through his grace for imperfection to be in the reality of perfection for all eternity. Praise the Lord. The C stands for through Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Why through Jesus Christ? Because Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Now, when I say that, some people get angry with me. They say that's very narrow. Yes, it is narrow. They, that, that doesn't leave a lot of room for a lot of other options. That's true. But I don't think it's mean. I don't think it's angry. I don't think it's unkind. I think it's just the opposite. See, if there were seven ways, I'd preach all seven. If there were three ways, I'd preach all three. But God said, instead of you trying to memorize seven ways how to get to heaven or measure, uh, memorize three ways to get to heaven, I'm going to simplify this. There's going to be one way that you need to know. There's only one way. It's the same for you. It's the same for you. It's the same for you. It's the same for me. We just need one way, and it's through Christ Jesus is how we get to heaven. It's a great act of grace. It's a great act of compassion that God wouldn't make us memorize multiple roads to heaven or that all roads would lead to heaven but that there is only one that we need to know and that we need to understand, and that's through Jesus Christ because he alone died on a cross and paid the price for our sins to be forgiven. Grace is free. There's no doubt about that, but it's not cheap. It cost Christ his life. It cost God sending his only son to this planet to die on a cross for you. And when God went into a bidding war for your soul, he looked around heaven for the most valuable thing that all of heaven held. Then he looked past streets of gold and gates made out of a single pearl and a sea made out of glass. And he looked into the eyes of his only son and he said, you are the most valuable thing this place holds. And I am bidding you in exchange for their souls so I will never be outbid by the enemy for those that I love. God sent the best, not a cheap knockoff. It was the best thing he had. That's why Christ came. And it's not cheap. It costs Christ everything. Grace is free. It's just not cheap. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man... How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many? The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know how the law works, right? The law absolutely is ironclad, and it just doesn't have any flexibility. I was in San Jose driving and I was reminded of this truth when I was driving through San Jose, and all of a sudden, there were some blue and red lights in, in my rearview mirror, and there was an officer behind me indicating that he'd like to spend some of his day with me. And so I pulled my car over. I'd been in some pretty heavy traffic, and I, uh, I pulled my car over to the side of the road, and he came up, very kind gentleman, very nice gentleman, and he said, hi, do you know why I stopped you today? And I thought that was so considerate. I said, well, I appreciate you stopping me and spending a little time with me today. Uh, let's see, uh, was I speeding? I mean, we were all doing four miles an hour, so I knew that I wasn't speeding. And he said, no, you weren't speeding. I said, did I 
change lanes without a turn signal indicator as taught by the law. He said, no, that was not why I'm stopping you. And I said, did I change lanes erratically as though drunk? He said, no, no, I don't think you're drunk. I said, wow, I'm sure doing a lot of things right in this car. I can't imagine why you're stopping me. He said, well, sir, you don't have your seatbelt on. Oh, oh yeah, well, let me tell you about that. Now, yesterday, I wore that thing. I had it on all day. I mean, you couldn't believe how I had my seatbelt on yesterday. I wore that thing out yesterday. It's kind of needing a little rest today. And then as soon as you and I get done talking, I'm putting that thing right back on. So you don't need to worry about the rest of today. Yesterday, it was well covered. Today is going to be well covered. And tomorrow, oh, I mean, I am Mr. Seatbelt USA from now on. He goes, that is awesome to hear. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a reminder for about 200 bucks. That's the law. That's the law. No wiggle room. I mean, all the good stuff I'm doing, no, no grace at all. If you could get to heaven on your own merit, then the cross would have been a waste. The fact of the matter was, heaven is perfect, God is perfect, we're not. And for that reason, Christ had to come and make a way for you to get there. If you could have gotten to heaven without any help from God, Jesus' death was a mockery. But there's no other way. You're either going to get to heaven through Christ or there's not going to be a way to get there. It's a free gift. You accept it by faith and it's something that Jesus, that God did through Christ. The E stands for eternal. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life. That means it goes on and on and on. That's the grace of God. It goes on and on and on. I accepted Christ when I was seven years old. I've been a Christian for 51 years, and there has been the grace of God that has matched every single day of my life since. And if I live to be 100, the grace of God will still be following me. And all through eternity, the grace of God will still be guarding me and protecting me while I'm in heaven, living in existence and perfection. The glory of God, the grace of God never, ever stops in our lives. It goes on and on and on, and the promise is for eternal life. You know what that means? God stamped on you an expiration date, but you were designed to live forever. God didn't put all the time, the energy, and the investment into you to make you a one of a kind with different fingerprints and DNA and retina scan and everything else just to have you die after 70, 80, 90 years. He wants you to live on forever. God is so crazy about you. He is so wildly in love with you that he says, I want you to be with me forever. Can you imagine that kind of compassion, that kind of grace, that kind of involvement that God says this thing isn't going to end after a little bit this thing goes on and on and on. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. It's a gift from God. And there's one catch. All this grace, all this goodness, all this gift that we described is the gift is only one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is somebody to accept the gift. A gift has to be accepted to have any meaning. If someone's just offering the gift, it means Nothing until somebody has accepted it and taken advantage of it. Four years ago, Valerie and I moved out of San Jose. We left that area. I stopped pastoring that church there, and I became the district superintendent. We moved to Sacramento, and we, we had to move our household. And I'm just going to be very honest with you. I don't know how it works in your house, but when we move, it's very stressful because Valerie and I are not alike we are not the same. We do not see things the same. And Valerie loves stuff and wants to hang on to stuff and buy more boxes for the stuff and bubble wrap all the stuff and put it in boxes and then, and then haul it all the way with you. And I just want to throw it away. I just want to bring 40-yard dumpsters in and fill all of them with the stuff and then tell the people that are buying the house, everything else is yours, you just keep it. We're starting over because we don't want any of it. And Valerie, when she packs, she, she picks the item up and she strokes it and she looks at it and then she remembers where we got it and she tells the story and then she says, we must, we must possess this for all time so I can show this to our grandchildren. 
good Lord. And I'm just in there trying to throw things away. So what we do is we pack in different rooms and we don't say anything to each other or we're going to need a therapist there to help us get into U-Haul. So I'm in the other room being a very good husband, mumbling about everything that I want to throw away, that I'm afraid to throw away, I'm packing it. And Valerie is reliving her entire life through stuff. (laughs) And she yells for the 45th time, oh, look at this, oh, look at this, Brett, come here, come quick, look at this. So I come walking in there, and she's got a box, and it's wrapped in paper, and it has a bow on it and my name on it. I said, what is this? She said, now this is June. This is your Christmas gift. I hid it from you and forgot. (laughs) Now, friends, honestly, I mean, you don't know me real well, but I'm not one of those guys that gets under the tree and digs at the paper and tries to see what's in the box. I'm not that guy. I just am very content waiting until Christmas morning and opening whatever it is. That year, I opened nothing. It was, it was hidden. It was in another room. It was under precious artifacts that we had to dig through just to find my Christmas gift. She hands it to me, and I received it, and I opened it, and I got to tell you, I loved it. I would have enjoyed it for six months already. But no, 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 no. I didn't get a chance to enjoy it. And to this day, that item sits on my desk, and I love it. The point's this. There can be a gift. It can be purchased. It can be specifically thought of with you in mind, reach, reaching out, offering it to you. But until you receive it, until you apply it, until you open it, and make it your own, it has no value to you. It's just like my Christmas gift under a whole pile of stuff. It meant nothing to me until I was able to receive it. God has a gift. Your name's on it. You were thought of specifically when he created it. He extended it to you. It's by his grace, through faith, by Christ Jesus, for everyone And it is eternal in nature. All you need to do is receive it. I'm going to pray for you. And while I pray for you, you talk to God about his grace. You let God remind you one more time about how special you are. About how much he loves you. And how gracious he is toward you. God wants to talk to you about a lot of stuff. And the reason he forgives our sin so quickly and removes it from us is because he doesn't want to spend a lot of time talking about our sin. He wants to talk about us and him. That's why he deals with our sin so quickly and so completely. You talk to God about his grace. You talk to God about his love. And let me pray for you. Father, thanks for today. Thanks for this great church. Thank you for your word that challenges us and corrects us and directs us. Thank you for Easter. An empty cross and an empty tomb. Thank you, Lord, for the services that will be packed in this place in just a couple of weeks to once again hear the reality of your grace. And Lord, I pray that you would cover my friends with your grace and your love, your compassion. Lord, that you would speak to them again and again of their eternal value in your kingdom and how you value their lives day by day by day. Lord, I ask this day that you would bless Pastor Scott. Be with him, God, as he travels. Be with him as he ministers. Make it fruitful. And Lord, add to him an encouragement and great strength, Lord, so when he returns to this church, he's ready to direct this flock into an important time of the year. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, the kindness that's been shown to me in this house. Lord, I ask that you would multiply it back to them many times over from your hand in accordance with your grace. 
in the name of Jesus.